Welcome to our podcast Discovering the Architecture Middle Path. This is our seventh episode and as usual I'm hosting with this Sanjeeva. Hi guys, uh, nice to be back after a little bit of a break. I think this is our first podcast of the, for the year, so Happy New Year. Exactly, Happy New Year. So uh, we picked an interesting topic, uh, it's called Platformless. Uh, you might be curious to understand what it is. So we are going to discuss uh, about this topic uh, during uh, uh, this uh, episode. Uh, so uh, before jumping to the topic, uh, we would like to uh, explain you why we uh, introduce a new concept um, and then get into the topic straight. Um, so uh, Sanjeev, I think uh, uh, it was uh, one of these calls we had working on something uh, else and then suddenly uh, you coined this term uh, platformless. I think we had this idea about um, this concept but uh, we were looking at a way how we can uh, put it out and uh, you came up with this word. So uh, why don't you start with that and a little bit explain about the uh, problem space that we are trying to address here. Yeah, uh, so if you, if you look at what we have been as a company, what our mission and our purpose has been from beginning has always been saying we are going to create an entire enterprise middleware platform. And the goal there, if you look at why are we creating a middleware platform, is to make it easier for developers to write their applications and focus on the business logic or the, the thing that they want to write and nothing else. And so we have been working at various parts of this now for 18 plus years. Um, the industry has evolved all kinds of new technologies, new approaches. We have created all kinds of things. But yet, if you look at any any enterprise really, except for a few exceptional organizations, developers spend a lot of their time and the architects and the IT and the CIO, all these guys spend a lot of their time and mental focus, not on what digital value you can create for the business, but how to build the foundation, how to, how to keep the lights on, how to do all these things that when you run a regular, when you look at the other parts of a business, take like collaboration right now we in ws2 we use google workplace suite a lot of other companies use office 365 uh, those are the two primary options but if i am starting a company today i pick one of these two and i now have everything i need for collaboration i don't need to think about email chat and when we started the company now this existed we were using pair.com email we set up our own calendar server we set up our own jabber server we set up some kind of file share so we could share documents and so on and on and on, right? That, that was the reality of collaboration. But there was no platform for collaboration available that took the focus away from you. Today, we go to O365 or Google Workplace Suite and the focus is on how can we collaborate better? How do I make these video calls work better? How do I make the document, you know, arguments that we have on chat to documents to whatever more effective? Not about how do I make it work. That's the analogy that we're trying to deliver here for developers to say, as a business, you should be focused on the analogy of just collaborating, which in our universe would be creating digital experiences. Not how do I make it scale? How do I secure it? How do I do zero trust? How do I do CICD? Why do all these wonderful, powerful, strong, important acronyms and terms that permeate the uh, industry we are in? So that's how platformless was created. Was basically that's how it came about, right? We were discussing something along exactly. these lines. I can't remember. Yeah. We're like, so what we are trying to create is a model where the platform kind of mills into the woodwork, and you just don't see it. So platform is there, of course, but it's not there. It's platformless. Exactly. I think in the tech world, uh, world less is more, right? Uh, we get yeah. it from different other concepts as well, like wireless, serverless. Uh, clientless, all these things yeah. were there. Yeah. Uh, so this is the next step of uh, uh, continuation yeah. of that it's same concept. Yeah. It really builds on all of those. Yeah. You know, wireless, I mean, wireless is a simple but good example. Uh, wireless effectively means uh, you just don't think about the wires. And of course, behind the wireless, there's wires. Behind serverless, there's servers. Behind platformless, there's a platform. Exactly. 
So after we got this idea, what we did as usual, we put it on a doc, like more like an internal technical uh, memo. And uh, we had a bunch of like discussions back and forth. And then we thought of, okay, it shouldn't be an internal memo. It has to be uh, an industry uh, related uh, technical paper. So we started uh, writing the paper and interestingly, we invited a guest. Actually, we can't tell a guest because family is not guest. And uh, the third person who contribute to the paper is uh, Paul Fremantle, the um, co-founder and founding CTO, one of our, my, my mentors as well. Uh, so we invited Paul and then um, I think we spent uh, many number of hours together on getting this uh, paper to the level that we can share it with the uh, industry. So that was uh, uh, kind of the work we did on getting uh, this paper out. Yeah, I, I think Paul, Paul's participation was critical. Uh, and, and of course, you and Paul wrote the cell-based architecture uh, paper about five years ago now, I guess, almost 2018. Uh, 2018, right? yeah. 18, uh, more than five years ago. <laughs> and um, and we wanted to create something like that. And cell-based architecture is also, it's not a, we're not pitching a WC product. We're not pitching anything. It's a conceptual way of thinking about a particular set of problems. Same thing with platformless. And so we wanted to write it in those terms and those uh, approaches. So Paul was uh, great, greatly helpful in, in also clarifying a bunch of stuff, helping identify what are the core anchors of what it means to be platformless. And uh, it was fun to work together again after a while. Exactly. And we were planning to... Do, so we do work together, but this is yeah. more of like on, on a very focused topic. So. Exactly. And we were planning to get him on this pod as well. But unfortunately, he's busy with building his second guitar. So he couldn't participate uh, on this. Uh, so yeah, I think we, we kind of uh, spoke about um, how the concept came. Uh, I think we can dig in deep into the uh, concept now. Uh, so as you clearly mentioned, we are clearly addressing a, a critical problem that we see in the enterprises and we were facing this with our customers and we identify there's a uh, there's a vacuum that we can fill from and, our and we, experience yeah. as well yeah and we help customers build platforms right for 20 exactly. years almost 20 years yeah. most of our customers what we've done with them is help them build the platform it's ongoing yeah. and it's very expensive and very slow right so exactly so so i think um, uh, so one thing we have to uh, highlight here platform less doesn't mean that platform is platform is going away there's a platform but it's about how we can abstract away that problem and then bring back the focus of these application development teams to focus on the business problems and then building applications rather than working on building this uh, platforms and dealing with all the infrastructure related uh, stuff as well as um, how we, they can bring the technology into the uh, platform that they are working on. So basically refocus, realign the enterprises on the uh, key problems that they have to sort out as well as um, how they can deliver more value into the business is the key thing that we are trying to highlight here. Yeah, so so I think I think that that's the real that's a key point. The, uh, what we have seen from our customers and and from many other people in the industry is that you spend all this time putting infrastructure together, and finally you get to writing some code or writing some applications and so on. But a lot of the focus of IT in many organizations is not on the actual application. So putting that infrastructure into a framework that you can uh, kind of assume just like you assume wireless or you assume serverless uh, you know all the all these aspects uh, as with uh, going with that theme of less is more is what we were trying to capture so may maybe we should begin to you know we, we we publish an equation into what a platform what it means to be platformless exactly. so let's go through that exactly so uh, like uh, we spoke about an abstraction but not to keep it at that level. That's where we came up with this, what it is in very uh, uh, concrete manner. So that's where the equation comes. So platform less uh, equals to four things. So platform less equal API first, uh, cloud native middleware, um, platform engineering, 
and uh, uh, developer experience. So those are the four technology domains that uh, a platform less experience should have. And uh, those are the four things that uh, the uh, people who's building platforms also should focus. Uh, so we can go uh, uh, through um, each uh, domain that we explain. Uh, so we can start with uh, API first, Sanjeev. Yeah, so APIs obviously are a, a fundamental concept in computing as a way of representing some functionality. And APIs obviously are not new. They've been around, uh, you know, they go back to the, the early days of Unix, this concept of having a system API and so on. And today, they are, we are, when we talk about APIs, we generally talk about network accessible endpoints, so network services, some functionality made available over the network. Uh, and the interface of that is the API that you are, the, the, uh, that's the application programming interface, basically, right? So APIs, that's the, the lowest part of what an API is. But then when you have a set of APIs, then you need to address a set of other problems like, okay, you need to govern them. You need to see who's using them. You need to manage access to them. You need to help discover them because, you know, we have many customers who have thousands of developers in the organization. Even within WS2, we have 400 people in our R&D team. Um, and for us, the, we find so often there's one side of the company working on something, another side working on the same thing because they didn't know about it. Right? So this, this reuse problem within software engineering has been a fundamental kind of a holy grail of achieving high quality software. And, and APIs achieve that at the internet level, but within the enterprise, when you have thousands and thousands of APIs, it becomes very difficult without having a full framework and a platform to make that work. And so API first for, from our mental model, and this fits with the next one that you, you are going to talk about, the, but the, the APIs can be different levels. I can write APIs around for my team. Nobody yeah. else uses it. I, I'm just sharing it within my little group that's building something. And then, or I could be creating some APIs or my group can be creating an API that is visible to the rest of the company, yeah. but not to the rest of the world. And, and, and a few groups will create APIs that are published to the rest of the world. So, so there are these kind of layers that you need to have. And in, in normal uh, API management terminology, that is internal API management versus external API management. But I think in our platformless mindset, we are, we are taking thinking about even deeper and identifying these different layers that you must have, which then, then gets into the question, of, okay, how do you get all that set up, which is what why you need cloud native middleware. Exactly. I think when it comes to APIs, there are like a bunch of things, right? Some Sometimes people think it's only a mindset uh, change, but then again, it is. But uh, the tool set that the organization is using to build this API should facilitate it. I think you made a really good point about the marketplace, how you can share these APIs, and then the underneath stuff about the gateways, access control, um, and then the um, about... Um, different type of uh, API styles and types also should support on how you can managing this stuff internally, right? Like uh, you get REST, uh, GraphQL, gRPC type of different styles from one end. And then the other side, you will get this uh, categorization like domain APIs, utility APIs, and then the experience APIs. So how you can facilitate those things. So basically the completeness, like um, it has to be a, a comprehensive set of tools that uh, the organization can take and be true API first at every level of the uh, cloud native application architecture that they are building uh, covering inside uh, API first. Uh, so the next uh, technology domain is about uh, cloud native middleware. And I think uh, middleware is something we can speak more than uh, ours because we are coming from middleware roots. And sometimes people think middleware is gone, but it's it's not gone, it's there in a different form because we are in a cloud native era. So it has to adjust and it has to uh, support all the cloud native concepts. That's why we even call it as a cloud native middleware. And without middleware, 
if there's no middleware, then the application developers, they have to do everything from scratch and then they have to build all these uh, uh, things that they can reuse and will be wasting a lot of time. So that's where still, even in the uh, cloud native era, these uh, middleware is playing a vital role for application development. And that's why we included it as the second pillar. Yeah, so, so I think the the concept of middleware in, in the early days, uh, you know, I think middleware, the term was invented in the late 80s by Oracle, um, and it meant a server running, providing some functionality, and you deploy something into that yeah. server so that the, the server can uh, gatekeep that functionality and invoke your code. Uh, ESBs, application servers, workflow engines, all kinds of things, right? But of course, in the in the cloud native era, when we are talking about containers and Kubernetes and things like that, or, or functions as service uh, uh, era, you don't have servers anymore. So middleware, instead of it being kind of holding your code together, your code runs and the middleware goes into two directions. On one side, it goes into the code itself. So for example, an HTTP engine is now part of every programming language. If I'm writing a program in Java, uh, I probably use Spring Boot. And it gives me a way to open an HTTP endpoint. Previously, I would write the program as a servlet and drop it into a servlet container, which gives me the HTTP endpoint. Now the mindset is, no, I just have the HTTP endpoint. Uh, so that's that's on one side. So where the some level of middleware is going into the component. And then the other level of middleware is going to the orchestration system, the runtime orchestration platform, Kubernetes, for example. So if you're thinking about load balancing, security endpoint management, a bunch of things are going out of the code into that operating environment. And there you get these additional things like service mesh infrastructure and so on that you need to have to provide this operating environment to get a resilient platform implemented in a cloud native way, in a cloud native environment. So if you expect every developer in every enterprise to go and go figure this stuff out and do it all by themselves. Yes, they can do it. Developers are very clever, but they're wasting time figuring out fundamentals of essentially modern computer science application architecture every single time, which is silly. So what, what we, in a platformless environment, you need the cloud native middleware to be omnipresent. So you can think at that application level and design the business domains that you want map them into an operating architecture and get it all up and running. And all these things like API gateways, service meshes, and so on are all just shows up when you need it at the right place. Kind of being at a fine dining restaurant, you know, when you want some water, it just shows up. You don't ever have to ask for it. You don't, you know, they don't fill it every time you take a sip, they don't come and fill it. They know exactly the right time to come and manage the experience for you. So not no interference, just, just them. Exactly. And I think the, the uh, something that we predicted some time back, the middleware is disappearing into code and infrastructure. So that's what's really happening, right? Even platform has become part of the infrastructure. So some of the middleware components will go into the platform and then provide it as a platform service. While as you uh, clearly explain, uh, some components will go inside the code. Uh, so it's uh, already happening. And I think that's where we even introduced this language called ballerina some time back by looking at uh, this movement uh, in the industry and the predictions that we had. Uh, so just a side note on that. Uh, so, so the uh, maybe, yeah. you should, uh, there's a good time also to talk a little bit about cell-based architecture. And oh yes, into yeah. Cloud native middleware and, and the role it plays in domain-driven design and all this stuff. Exactly, so that's a key part of our architecture. Uh, the way we think that uh, platformless should be delivered. Exactly, exactly. So I, I think this is a uh, uh, this is something that we saw inside the enterprises for a while. That how these teams, um, the architecture. Uh, development, deployment, all these things can like uh, connect together because uh, the architect will architect something and then developer will go and develop something completely different and then the um, deployment side will happen in a totally different way. So how we can have a common way of doing that 
uh, across all these uh, different uh, design time aspect as well as runtime aspect is where uh, the cell-based architecture is coming and playing a role. And that's where the teams are organized as well because uh, now uh, in most of the enterprises you have this practice of calling uh, two pizza teams. I think now it's called one pizza teams with all the new changes are happening. But you have these autonomous teams. Uh, so how you can uh, get that uh, autonomous teams working on a specific set of uh, uh, functionality? It can be a set of services and it can have uh, like uh, things like uh, message brokers. All these things we call as components in the cloud native architecture. So how you can group them together and then map it to something meaningful. So mapping can be coming from a domain, uh, from domain driven design, or it can be a subdomain, or it can be some kind of a, a grouping mechanism that the organization is following. So that way you have um, a proper way of organizing, organizing these workloads and then expose them as APIs out of the uh, particular domain and then have the proper access control that's what you explained earlier about this uh, ingress uh, traffic and then egress traffic how we can control it and provide proper guidelines for the organizations to operate in that way uh, so that's where cell-based architecture coming and playing a huge role and even uh, we think that's where the uh, uh, cloud native middleware and how these uh, middleware component should organize and uh, distribute across the organization so if you look at the aspects of cloud native middleware that you need to have so you have the lowest level foundational things like a kubernetes level orchestration container orchestration kind of stuff or or a, a say a serverless runtime platform you need but when you go beyond that you need to have this kind of an abstraction such as cell-based architecture in order to organize all the work yeah. and then you bring in api management service mesh all this supporting infrastructure which forms the entire middleware so the developers can focus on just write the code nothing exactly else. And probably we will uh, talk about the cell-based architecture in the future as well. I'll probably do a separate episode um, on that. So we are moving to the fourth pillar, sorry, the third pillar. So the, the uh, it's a very uh, uh, interesting topic uh, these days because there's a huge demand for uh, platform engineers in the market and uh, there are a lack of platform engineers we heard from some of the recruiting firms as well why it is happening because um, they are the one who's building these platforms uh, so uh, uh, that's a, a really important part in the uh, uh, the uh, pla the platformless concept that uh, that uh, the the process of platform engineering will bundle everything together yeah, I, I think uh, platform engineering is obviously a very hot topic. Um, and in, in many ways, it is uh, the DevOps teams that were facilitating deployment and operation ha have now provided a next level up saying platform engineering should give developers everything they need to focus on engineering. And whether it is getting observability, getting all this infrastructure set up, platform engineering is the sort of the discipline of creating that operating environment for development. And so from our perspective, from the point of platform less, platform engineering is really the foundation. Okay. It is the engineering of the platform that allows you to create a platformless environment. And then in that process of engineering, you need to have API first behavior, you need to have cloud native middleware and the fourth pillar we are going to talk about yeah and i think some organization treating platform engineering only for the development side not on the uh, production run times but in our definition we connect those two the uh, Dev devops and sre or site reliable engineering both uh, together into a uh, platform engineering so that way it's a combination of uh, uh, providing facilitate uh, the development and then the production runtimes as well. Yeah, uh, yeah. So, so I just, yeah. just want to add something to that. I think that that's a very important point you made that, that the, the runtime aspect uh, must be taken into consideration because from the point of view of the application developer, if you don't take into account 
what I can assume at runtime, the development organization has to go set up all that stuff on top of the underlying platform. Yeah. Right. And and uh, these things are in a modern environment. Uh, you would never put something up available on the internet or a, even an internal network without security, without if it's an endpoint, it's some kind of an API, uh, secured API architecture. You shouldn't deploy anything without a zero trust architecture. So, so there are these kind of runtime things that have to be present and the developers should just assume that's there when they start writing code on top of it. Yeah, I think that's a good uh, entry point for the fourth uh, uh, domain that's about the developer experience because uh, end of the day, developers are the one who's creating these applications and then uh, delivering these digital experiences to the end users. And that's what the business is uh, mainly focusing on. So making developers productive is key. Like, uh, like whatever the platform that uh, built, if it is not addressing the developer needs, like the self-service nature and all the development um, uh, tools that they require to do, build this end-to-end uh, cloud native application should address in the platform. I think this is something that is missing in some of the platforms that uh, we see in the market as well. Uh, more focus on platform engineering, but less focus on the application developer. Yeah, the, the key, I kind of see the key there as when you talk about developer experience, you want to give developers all the freedom they want to have, not the freedom they want don't want to have. Developers don't like to be told, use this library for doing this function they should be able to create what they want. If they want to use a particular library for something or the other, that should be created. So, so there's a very subtle line that you have to draw between saying, this is the way we do a queue, this is the way we do a database, this is the way we do this. How, how high up you go with that on one angle that makes the developer experience easier because everything is selected. On the other side, that has removed a lot of creativity and opportunity for decision making for developers. So you want to do developer empowerment and let the developer create. So you need to bring the platform up to the right level, but not too far. Exactly. I think that's where all these concepts like uh, polygon programming on like uh, how they can choose their uh, preferred language within set of things that uh, the enterprise can approve. And I think, uh, again, we are going back to the cell-based architecture a little bit, like how they can have freedom within those uh, uh, cells. Um, and then the uh, tooling aspect of as it as well, how the tooling uh, deeply connected with the platform. So uh, because developers, they like to use their preferred ID. And then uh, some developers, especially in this cloud native era, they like to use the command line a lot uh, because CLI stuff are really fun to have and use. Uh, so uh, how uh, these these things are addressing without trying to change the developer behavior, rather uh, try to make them productive by using all these tools. I think that's where some of these um, AI capabilities uh, might come and help as well because uh, it's all about uh, how we can increase the developer productivity. Yeah, I think I think uh, Gartner has this terminology they use, I think called AI augmented software engineering. Yeah. Uh, so really AI, uh, as AI approaches and models and tools develop, what we expect is that it plays a role in all of these functions. So as you do, as you work in a internal developer platform kind of environment where which delivers this platformless experience, whether it's whether you have built it yourself or you bought it, the, in that experience, the, you are expecting that there is a little bit of a clippy-like thing that is around always giving you guidance and helping you out, right? So, so like a, that's why I think AI augmented software engineering means on all aspects of software engineering, whether it is on on the the auto, the one that. A lot of people are focused on and new companies are being formed on is on on uh, code uh, code authoring code generation natural language code developer tools at that level but that's the the sort of the last part of the software engineering problem very important the code matters but the code doesn't live by itself code fits into other things code needs to reuse 
all of those are part of the software engineering problem as well exactly so we covered all four uh, uh, technology domains that uh, connect and creating platformless api first cloud native middleware uh, platform engineering and uh, developer experience. So I think uh, we should a uh, little bit discuss about how an organization can achieve a uh, platformless because um, this is nice, it's in a specification or a manifesto, but how you can achieve it is going to be the key thing. And uh, we identified two parts. One part is uh, you build it. Uh, the second part is uh, you buy it. Uh, so uh, we can start with building. Uh, so if you are building, I think there are a few things that you need to consider. Uh, first thing is about these key four capabilities, whether it's delivering in the platform that uh, you are designing and building. Otherwise, it will be not complete. Uh, so if it is not complete, um, like uh, this shadow IT days, people will go outside the platform and start building these applications. So that is one. And the second thing is uh, without um, uh, disturbing the application developers have a skilled dedicated uh, uh, platform engineering team who will take this responsibility and build uh, the platform that way the application developers can focus on building the applications. Um, so I think uh, understand this, understanding this complexity and uh, understanding the requirement correctly and uh, treating the platform as a product is a key thing because it's an ongoing thing because the technology uh, can change and the organization requirements can change. So that way treating it as a product is very, very important if you are taking the uh, build path. Yeah, and, and, and also when you try to build, there are frameworks you can use. There are open source uh, internal developer platform frameworks you can use, or you can take the bits and put them together yourself. But one other part you also have to consider is a, in a modern cloud era, typically more and more customers are having a multi-cloud architecture, which also includes more and more this cloud repatriation path on-prem components. So you do need to uh, figure out how you're going to build this in a way that can work across a set of underlying infrastructure. So we, which one challenge of building therefore is the skill set you need to put together because you really need a team that understands not just AWS if you if you want it's AWS, Azure, GCP, uh, maybe it is uh, DigitalOcean, maybe it is something else, maybe it is some communities you run yourself and so on. So there's a lot of infrastructure that you need to put together, but we have many customers who built superb platformless experiences for themselves, putting things together. And of course, if you need, you know, if, if you do need to put API management, security, we didn't talk much about authentication and security yet, but that's a critical component of everything. Uh, if you want to do that, they, you know, you can use products like what WC2 has, API management products and IAM products. So you, you can put that together and, and it's it's completely fine. And we, we, we hope to bring a couple of customers to our podcast who will talk about what they've done with that, building their own platform and very successfully. Yeah. I think the other part is uh, basically buy that's uh, kind of consume and um, uh, already available or commercially available uh, platform that provide provides platformless experience. So that's the uh, second path uh, that you can take. Uh, uh, so uh, uh, I think that's a viable uh, solution. Uh, that way the entire organization can become platformless because now you are not uh, and, and you are not focusing uh, on the platform at all, just you are consuming. There can be configurations and there can be some of the fine tuning that you might have to do um, uh, to make it more uh, organization friendly and then uh, fit into your enterprise architecture. But uh, you will be saving a lot of time when we take the uh, by path. Yeah, and, and um, another thing to keep in mind is, uh, uh, again, if you're a smaller company, you're better off with a buying approach than building because to put all these things together is a massive undertaking. And it's not a one-time job. Once you put it together, you have to stay on top of versions. You have to, you know, as uh, new deployment strategies come up, you have to implement those. Uh, there, there are, it's a permanent pro 
uh, product on its own. I think that's why people say we should treat the platform as a product, not as a yeah. project. You have to keep on evolving it. So, uh, but if you buy something, you kind of offload that to somebody else and say, "Here, give me the experience that I want, and you get it to work." So, uh, our general, uh, I think, uh, Asanka, you and I agree on this one that this is a layer that if you can buy it, you should buy it. If you can't buy it, of course, then you must build it because that that the abstraction of being platformless and the value it delivers to the organizations, organization in terms of the focus it allows the business to have on digital experience is so so important. Yeah, hundred percent agree. So I think uh, um, as an architect, you might be questioning how this can be beneficial for you. Uh, so that's where. Uh, the the uh, how this platformless concept is connecting with uh, enterprise software engineering coming and playing a role here uh, because when it comes to enterprise it's not like you just write a web app or you just write a mobile app you have to deal with a lot of complexity because there can be existing systems and then businesses are not uh, running as a silo that you need to connect with uh, the ecosystem and it can contains the partners and sometimes the organizations are going through acquisition so different type of systems are coming so that's the complexity that you have to deal uh, on day-to-day basis at the same time you have to deliver value to the business as well so that's where we thought this is going to be a really important thing when you are dealing uh, in the uh, enterprise uh, software engineering. I think, you know, as an architect in an in a enterprise, and, and here I'm talking about an architect in a company that is producing maybe a digital product or may not be a digital product, but in the end, they are, your job as an architect is to deliver some business value to that organization, not to make more foundation matter. So to deliver business value to the organization, the more you can just shove under the table and not have to worry about it, the the better it is. That is one of the reasons serverless is so interesting and powerful, especially things like serverless databases. You just let it go and it works and you just pay a lot of money sometimes, but it works. So you kind of are able to create without having to worry about that layer. So that that is the point about enterprise software engineering. So the whole point of platformless is really to facilitate enterprise software engineering where you are doing actually software engineering, which includes the design, the the entire methodology of how you go about iteratively developing things, uh, how you reuse, how you find, uh, you know, life cycle management, all of those things that you need to do when you have a portfolio of products. And that's what an enterprise is. Even even WS2 has about 50 different applications we used to run the company. When I was in IBM, there were, at the time, this was in 1997 to 2005, there were 40,000 applications in the company that ran the company. So that's the kind of numbers we're dealing with in, as you get larger and larger. So if, uh, having a, so that enterprise software engineering of that is a product line architecture problem. It's not just a single product architecture problem. So having a platform that kind of takes that away and gives you this experience or you have all that all that underlying layer covered is really valuable. Yeah. Okay, I think it, uh, it's coming to end of another episode. And um, I think, uh, uh, as usual, it was very interesting. Uh, and even I learned some new stuff, Sanjeev. Uh, so, um, uh, and we are planning to continue this conversation. And then we are going to dig in deep into some of the aspects that we spoke in this episode. Um, and uh, we are going to uh, uh, kind of announce those topics uh, in the future as well. Uh, So thanks for joining and uh, we will catch you in another episode. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. It's been a bit of a long episode. So if you made it all the way through here, thank you for listening and see you soon.